I'm an associate fellow here at the Hanno Rent Center, a former Bard College graduate, an early college graduate as well. I'm a staff associate. Uh, really, I function as a clinical research manager at the department of, in the Department of Neurology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, um, where I design and test random clinical trials. So I have a lot of ideas actually about sortition and citizen assemblies as models of something, um, especially with regard to technocratic expertise. Um, but I'm joined today by some very distinguished individuals who have a wide range of experience, um, you know, demonstrating citizen assemblies in a wide variety of places. You know, we have uh, Bel we have Serbia represented, we're going to talk about Latin America, and then of course Ireland. Um, and so to begin, I want to introduce um, Jane, Dr. Jane Souter, who is a professor in the School of Communications at Dublin City um, University, director of DCU's Institute for Future Media, Democracy and Society, and a senior research fellow on the Irish Citizens Assembly. And then I would also like to introduce Dr. Gazella Pura-Drasco, a political sociologist and a director at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, University of Belgrade, Serbia. I would also like to introduce Dr. Irina Fickett, is a research fellow at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, the University of Belgrade, Serbia. And then I would also like to introduce Dr. Tammy Pogrebinski, is a senior researcher at the WZB Berlin Social Science Center and faculty member of the Berlin Graduate School of Social Sciences at Humboldt University. So the way in which this will work, uh, we will hear from Dr. Jane Sur first, followed by Drs. Drasko and Fiket, and then Dr. Pograsenci. And afterwards, I will lead with a few questions and we'll open it up to the audience. So this ends around 1, 105. So we're gonna really you know, make sure that we get as many questions in as possible. So I leave it to you, Dr. Suter, you have the floor. That's great, thank, thank you very much. And uh, lovely, to, lovely to be here. Pity that I'm not uh, over there, but uh, that's the way things are uh, these days. And just before I start, actually, I'd like to say uh, congratulations to David and uh, everybody he worked with in, in FIDE and everybody else on, on the advice in Paris. It's fantastic news that that uh, vote came through today. So I was just asked to do a very short um, sort of 10 minute overview of the Irish Citizens Assembly. Um, and obviously then afterwards in questions, I can go anyway. I think actually the, the, uh, the thoughts around how citizens assemblies can work with technocracy is, like, is a really interesting one and one where research is going now. So I'm just going to uh, share my uh, screen here. Um, can you, is that showing up okay? Yes. Okay, that's great. So yeah, I'm just going to do um, you know a, a quick enough sort of overview, so as we then get um, some time for questions and discussion. But I think the interesting thing is that uh, the Irish Citizens Assembly, um, like many of the others, so like the 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 one that's a little bit different at the moment in Chile or in Iceland or in other places, it was born out of out of crisis. So it was politicians. Uh, being willing to look at doing something different because of crisis. And in the, the Irish case, it was following the 2008 Great Recession. Um, Ireland was particularly badly hit with some countries in Southern Europe, such as Spain, Portugal, Italy and Greece, by the banking collapse, um, with very serious uh, job losses, with a um, serious amount of debt, the IMF and the World Bank came in and essentially ran the uh, the Irish fiscal policy uh, for an, for a number of years, and so politicians realised that there was a crisis, and they were more open to innovative suggestions than they would have been, I think, if everything were still going uh, well and uh, it was booming. Um, and I think the idea of the citizens' assemblies, it came out of the experience in uh, British Columbia, first of all, where the, um, there, there had been a citizen assembly looking at uh, basically electoral reform, which had run for um, a long period of time, people looking at different sort of voting systems. Now, ultimately, as I'm sure a lot of the audience here know, that didn't actually go anywhere. The, there was uh, super majorities imposed and politicians uh, campaigned against it. But nonetheless, we could look at British Columbia, Ontario and the Netherlands 
and see that, in fact, citizens um, in the real world could be asked fairly complicated policy questions and could come up with uh, compromises and um, with answers. So myself and a group of other Irish political scientists, we worked with actually some uh, US philanthropist, Chuck Feeney, um, and we put together a, an experimental citizen assembly called We the Citizens. And in this, we first went around the country as uh, sort of small town hall type meetings, asked people what was most concerning them, and then convened this citizen assembly of 100 randomly selected citizens. And we got them to look at different sorts of uh, policy questions like the balance between tax and spending and so on. Um, and before that, we'd heard a lot that we couldn't, you know, that, you know, Canadians are very sensible or the Dutch are very sensible. So that's why you could ask their citizens to do things. But, you know, Irish people wouldn't be able to uh, come up with the compromises necessary. Or we heard um, kind of things like, you know, we already have a citizens assembly. It's called the parliament. But I think after we ran this, we were able to um, bring it around to the different political parties and so on, and demonstrate that in fact, this was a model that could work, um, that it was something that citizens themselves would very much embrace, that they would enjoy doing it, but that also that it would, could provide really useful policy input um, for policymakers and for politicians and, and so on. So one result was that the, in the, uh, the forthcoming um, election then, in 2011, the, uh, the, government, the governing parties had a proposal for um, a convention on the constitution. There's a lot of detail around it, which, which doesn't really matter, but it was to do with sort of issues around um, uh, where there was kind of inter and inter-party, intra-party uh, disagreement. So for example, marriage equality was, uh, was a big issue in Ireland at the time. One of the political parties very much wanted to put marriage equality on the agenda and the other was a lot more agnostic about it with some parts of the party very much, um, very much against it. So there was an agreement that there would be this convention on the constitution as it was called. Now the way this first one differed from what had been done before was rather than have a hundred uh, randomly selected citizens. There were 66 citizens and then 33 politicians. We were nervous in the beginning that the politicians would dominate because they're used to deliberation and disagreement and so on. But in fact, all of our research showed that they very much uh, went with the, at the round tables, the kind of spirit of it, about tolerance and respect and equality at the, um, at the tables. And you can see there in the, you know, the bottom uh, right hand corner, it was in a hotel ballroom. So more normally there would be weddings on here. The citizens sat at round tables. So that was very different to British Columbia where it was much more of a sort of a lecture hall type um, environment. And at each table, there was a facilitator and a note taker to try to ensure that sort of tolerance and that sort of respect. And the other thing was that it wasn't just about citizens listening to, uh, to experts. The interest groups and the lobby groups were, were brought in. So when we talked about marriage equality, Amnesty International would have shared the stage with the Catholic Bishops Conference, for example, as just different interest groups in it. And then also very much people's lived experience, because when you're asking ordinary randomly selected citizens, everybody has different learning modes and so on. And so if they can actually listen to uh, people like us and their lived experience, that can, um, that can really help. There was a wide range, a very eclectic agenda that was looked at. Some of it, to be honest, was just sort of fillers to see how it would work. Um, but others were, um, were more substantive. So afterwards, there, for example, there were a lot of changes to parliamentary rules and there, were, you know, there was a, a, a referendum on abortion, but the headline referendum, of course, was on uh, marriage equality because that Citizens' Assembly um, voted in favour of marriage equality and voted in favour of holding a referendum. So as a result, Ireland became the first country in the world um, to actually vote for marriage equality by popular vote rather than by uh, vote of parliament. So I think that's one of the things that made people 
uh, sit up and, uh, and start paying um, attention to it. So the next government that came in in 2016, the politicians um, had already seen how this worked up front. They had been in the room, they'd been members, some of the senior politicians had, been, had, uh, had taken part. And uh, one of the, the issues that was um, very salient at the time was abortion rights. Ireland was one of the countries in the world with the most restrictive um, abortion law um, at the time. We were in uh, trouble with uh, UN committees and so on. And another one was on climate change, where Ireland was very much a laggard, particularly because of the, the very strong um, agricultural uh, lobby. And then again, there were two more that, again, the government kind of pick and chose, and it didn't do so much um, with those. But those citizens sat in the same room, you can see it there, in the, the same sort of seaside resort hotel and the, the wedding room, a new carpet there, but again, at the round tables. Now, this time it was 100 citizens. I think the, um, there was two reasons for that. One is that the abortion debate was particularly acrimonious, um, so they didn't want to be part of it. And the second was that they actually trusted uh, the process. So this time, um, again, it's kind of this, the thing I want to stress is the kind of link back into the representative system. So when you have the strong links we found in Ireland between the sort of the deliberative and the, and the representative, then the, um, it leads to greater democratic legitimacy and a greater likelihood that the politicians will act on the, on the recommendations. So, these were considered in parliamentary committees. And once again, we had um, the vote by referendum to liberalize the, um, to liberalize the uh, abortion laws and by similar sort of margins as the, as the citizens, um, as well as a declaration of a, of a climate emergency in the, in the parliament. And the actual detail of that and the, you know, what's actually happening is of course, slower, you know, it's much easier to kind of vote for something um, like a climate emergency than actually implement the carbon taxes and so on. But they are now on the on the way through. And then our most recent one has been on, um, I'm not quite sure why my, oh, there we are, has been on gender equality. So, um, we just finished up this one again. There's meant to be another referendum, which is going to uh, change the constitution in in, uh, in those kind of terms. So basically, the the idea of the the Irish citizen assemblies is that they're a mirror of society. But we are having uh, debates about how to bring in more marginalised and uh, younger generations. Um, there have been, as I say, a number of uh, you know outcomes to date. Uh, changes to the constitution, policy changes, and so on. And I think the important thing to remember is this kind of uh, mixing of representative and deliberative uh, democracy where the citizen assembly comes between the government and parliament, but again, its outputs go back to the, uh, to the government and the, and the parliament. But we're still looking at the kind of institutionalization. So how can we follow uh, Ausbelgian or Paris to, uh, to really be able to integrate the Citizen Assembly in. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, next up, our, our friends in, in Serbia, you, you two uh, have, have 10 minutes to share. Okay, hello. I'm right to and then to leave Gazella, uh, the ground. Um, okay, we, we heard about the basic assumptions of the citizen assembly, so I'll not repeat that part. What we did in Serbia was actually an attempt to test for the first time in Serbia, actually, the possibility of conducting citizen assemblies. So our citizen assembly, uh, assemblies were not institutions integrated into the political system, but more in social science experiment in the environment, which are not uh, actually uh, uh, um, have a habit of citizen participation. However, following uh, the systemic approach of deliberative democracy, we tried actually to take into account specificities of political context when we were designing the model of citizen assembly. So we introduced different variables into the design, uh, following the, the context of Serbia, which is a liberal democracy characterized by huge mistrust of citizens in institutions, 
but also in one another, passivity, regime control media, low electoral turnout, low levels of participation in any kind of conventional political channels. But at the same time, in the last five years in Serbia, we actually saw this democratization potential in proliferation of citizen initiatives and social movements and increasing participation in forms of unconventional political channels such as protest petitions. So we have on the one side this lack of trust in institutions and on the other side we have increasing participation in unconventional political channels. So we actually decided to design citizen assemblies that will allow us to investigate actually the interaction between top-down citizen assemblies and bottom-up citizen, citizens' mobilization. In uh, practical terms, that actually translated into the composition of our discussion groups of citizens that were composed not only from stratified sample of the population affected by the issues we choose for the assemblies, like uh, citizen assemblies are usually done in that way, but we also include a subsample of the uh, from the composed from the members of the citizen initiatives and social movements that through their political actions showed interest in the topics. Uh, in fact, we had uh, four small group discussion groups and each one was composed from six to seven ordinary citizens selected in order to represent the population in social demographic terms and two active citizens representative of citizen initiatives of that topic. Um, we further included the voices of citizen initiatives and social movements uh, within the briefing materials. Uh, we included their positions and arguments, and they were also participating in the panels with expert politicians. And this is what our effort actually to include this, uh, this different voice uh, coming to the, from the bottom up. Uh, and now uh, I can let uh, Gazella say what really happened in our citizen assemblies and we, what we can actually learn from our experience. Well, yes, thanks, Irena. As you mentioned, I mean, we are working in the context of capture states where we have uh, political elites which are not really working in the public interest, but uh, rather in their own interests or interests of uh, uh, economic elite, which is very much uh, inter intervene with the political elites. We had actually uh, two top. Well, I'm still here. <laughs> I lied. This is not the future. This is <laughs> this is not the future. Well, you know, in the meantime, um, I won't do stand-up comedy, but does anyone have questions? That way, when they come back, we can just, I can keep them on cue. No questions so far? Everyone's an expert in citizen assemblies. <laughs> David, yeah. Well, do you actually, you have a question for this, this one, so I'll take your question. Okay, we are, we are coming back. Oh. You'll be first. <laughs> so we can continue, yes? Yes, yes, you keep going. Okay. So basically, we had uh, difficulties uh, in getting decision makers to the, these sessions. Uh, in Belgrade, we have had actually representatives of the city uh, government, uh, but uh, the person who took part in this session, which was dedicated to uh, discussion with the policymakers, actually did more of populist speech, which didn't address any of the questions which were raised during the discussion. So it wasn't really beneficial for the discussion. And citizens felt very much encouraged and in general, you know, impotent as they usually feel uh, when it comes to this kind of situation, when they voice something, but there is no response. There is like a silence from other side and uh, talking their own talks uh, in this way. In, uh, in Valio, which is a smaller city, we didn't even have uh, decision makers participating. So in spite of several rounds of uh, uh, 
invitations and also some of them confirmed they didn't show up which also showed uh, uh, the, the, I mean, the lack of the political interest to involve citizens in this kind of decision making, which is the, basically the core issue which we have in Serbia, having in mind this illiberal democracy or hybrid regime or authoritarian regime or whatever, uh, competitive authoritarians, whatever the name uh, for this kind of regime uh, we can choose. So uh, in the end, we had uh, I can compare to what uh, uh, what Jane said about Ireland. Uh, during the discussion, we had the same experience. So the people who participated were tolerant, were respecting each other. We didn't have any major issues in in organizing and moderating discussion. We also had professional moderators who that also helped. But uh, this feeling of impotence, which uh, uh, which was brought in the end uh, by actually uh, lacking any chance to to influence any kind of decision, is something which we felt in the end as a result of this. Uh, citizens' assemblies. So this is something which is a general problem when we are working in an environment which is not friendly for citizen, for citizen participation. Or to be more precise, we are working in an environment which is actively disencouraging citizens' participation in decision-making. So that is the problem. So how to do this uh, in our case, we believe, and this is the, the point of the investigation which we would like to continue, we believe that working with uh, local initiatives or some stronger civil society organization, we have one of them who is actually organizing three citizen assemblies uh, based on this model which we established now in Belgrade, uh, that this can help somehow citizens to get in touch again with the process of decision making or empower them to have simply more strength or uh, be more ready to part take part in decision making, which is something in our context, which is authoritarian context, that is the, the I mean, uh, they need to step in in order to take it over because uh, the, the political elites will not let them uh, to uh, to take this power. So this is something which we are waiting to see what is going to happen. But basically, this is the general conclusion from this part of uh, of, of world. So we are working with those who want to. Uh, channel citizens' voices uh, into the process of decision making or preparing at least for the process of decision making at the point where uh, they are going to be able to do so. All right. Thank you very much. And some experimental views from, from Latin America now. Um, so, hi. Um, well, I was really glad to be invited to join this panel and um, share my experiences. The only problem is that I have no experience at all with citizens in living in Ireland and Serbia. So, um, but I do have some experience with direct innovations, with democratic innovations in general in Latin America. So I will move the panel a bit in that direction and then come back to the citizens assembly. Um, over the last six years, I designed and coordinated a project called the Latino Innovation for Democracy in Latin America. Maybe few of you have heard of it. Basically, we built a data set on democratic innovations um, in Latin America. We looked at two 18 countries for a period of 30 years, from 1990 to 2020. And the project just came to an end this uh, summer. And uh, we have this big database online with a total of 3,744 cases of democratic innovation. So those are cases at the local, regional, and national level in 18 countries, um, created over a period of 30 years, and they are not counted as each replication of one similar institutional design. They are like different institutional design. The whole idea of the project was looking to variation of institutional design. Well, um, it's interesting to, to look to this database, which is online, you can look at it, uh, latino.net, um, and then you see that um, out of those 3,744 cases, 1,605 are deliberative innovations, are democratic innovations that have deliberation as a primary means of participation. This makes almost half of the database, 43%, to be more uh, precise. And actually, if we look to different periods, like the 90s and then the 2000 deliberation made much more of uh, the half, about 60%, and some 
uh, periods. Actually, in the last five, six years, we have seen a change because we have much more digital democratic innovation taking the place of um, previously deliberative innovation. But this is another topic. Well, but looking to this say, big data set, looking to, to Latin America over the last 30 years in terms of citizen participation, what we see is um, seven families of institutional designs that have deliberation as primary means of participation. And just one of them is citizen assembly. So those seven families, um, I would, and I did classify them based on those empirical cases at for the participatory budgeting, which you can, um, almost everyone here should know. Participatory planning, um, and I may talk about that later, but not now because I only have five minutes. I mean, how each of them look like? Oh, well, deliberative councils, deliberative tables, prior consultations, multilateral policy making, and citizen design. And out of those 1,605 deliberative innovations in Latin America, 135 are citizen assemblies. But out of those 135, only five are real citizen assemblies, like those we're talking about here today, which are citizen assemblies which rely on situation, on random selection in order to provide and facilitate your deliberation. Now, what does it mean that Latin America has almost no um, citizens assemblies while it is home to almost 4,000 different democratic innovations. Uh, I guess that looking to Latin America is relevant because this is where the first empirical cases that fed the whole debates on participatory democracy over the last two decades come from. In particular, Latin America was the home of the participatory budgeting, which as a hope to revitalize democracy has indeed revitalized the democratic theory reawakening participatory theory, giving rise to deliberative theory in the entire field of democratic innovation. So I think it is important to have to reflect on the fact that this current boom of citizen assembly is quite similar to the one we have actually witnessed about two decades ago with the participatory budgeting. Perhaps we could learn lessons, especially regarding what happens to democratic innovations as they travel around the world. So the participatory budgeting was a democratic innovation originated in Latin America, which several studies showed as it traveled everywhere, especially to the global north, it has not always been successful as it originally was in Porto Alegre, Brazil, as it was once created. And part of this lack of success, according to several good researchers, is that the participatory budgeting's original ability to promote social justice was lost. So the concept of participatory budgeting somehow traveled well, but its practice was, with few exceptions, lost in translation. Just to be clear, the participatory budget has somehow always been successful in including more citizens in policy process. But the research showed that out of its original context, it was not successful in dealing with the main democratic problem which originated it, which was social inequality. Now, we have the citizens' assemblies spreading all over the global north about 100, uh, I guess I heard today, just in the last year, most of them in Europe, a quick stretch, similar to the one we've seen with the participatory budget in the 2000s. But apparently, the citizens' assembly have been mostly a solution from advanced democracies to advanced democracies. They have so far almost not been implemented in the global south, in developing democracies, especially in those endangered by high social inequality and political exclusion as well as those that deal with much deeper deficits of representation. And I mean, countries where the, the crisis of representation is not simply a matter of low electoral turnout, but a matter of historically unaccountable and unresponsible, really weak political institutions, to say the least. And also very important, historically fragile young democracies, which are now, again, endangered by populism and authoritarianism. Because I'm, I was asking myself, um, are citizen assemblies, I mean, those that rely on sufficient, because the Latin American citizen assemblies, they are of a different nature, and um, we may talk about that later if we have time. But citizen assemblies, as we know them in the global north, um, are they also able to revitalize democracy where democracy is not merely on crisis, but is young and weak and clearly endangered by problems such as social inequality, political exclusion, populism, and authoritarianism? I'm actually not sure. Um, my feeling is that high social inequality and political exclusion might hinder the, those desirable effects um, of sufficient. 
and deliberation in citizen assemblies might not be one among equals. And yeah, so this is basically what I wanted to say today. And I, I guess um, it's perhaps important maybe to build on those lessons um, from the participatory budget and to ask uh, when we design new institutions for um, democracy, how much should we pay attention to context and at the same time, at the same time, be able to address all democratic problems faced by different democracies uh, around the world. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so I'll I'll get us started. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll only I'll only use two of them. And I want to I'm I'm going to think through what might be called ordinary people. Um, such as my father or an uncle, right? Who would who would be listening to this right now and you know hearing us talk? You know, I do clinical research. You are all sociologists, political scientists. We traffic in a language of measurements, outcomes. We are technocratic individuals, right? We are experimenting. This conference might be called Experiments of Democracy. Oh, sorry, can you guys hear me now? Yes. So this, you know, this might be called Experiments of Democracy instead of you know revitalizing it. Um, the question that my dad had asked, what's the point, right? And that, that, that seems somewhat facetious in, in, a, in, a, in a way, but I think what he's actually getting at is, okay, in one context, it sounds like this is, and as we've heard, you know, it sounds as if citizen assemblies, this particular kind of experiment is about trying to see whether or not people can come and talk about the most contentious problem in a given context. In another context, it seems as if people simply actually want political power, and political power starts by being able to talk about the issue at hand. You know, you mentioned um, feeling of impotence as a negative outcome, right? You know, because you're you're trying to do this in the context of a captured, um, you know, a captured setting, so to speak, right? And then we have almost two thousand different kinds of innovative things happening, where only five of them seem to be you know, related directly to sortition. So what, what exactly is the outcome that we're trying to, that each of you is trying to measure here? You know, what is the, what is the ultimate goal? Is this, is a citizen assembly supposed to, are we, are we modeling, for example, a new kind of institution that participates directly in the democratic process, where it's not just recommendations, but power, the force of power? Right outside of outside of talk. Can you can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. So are we are we trying to you know model? That, as I said, are we trying to model um, an institution that that fits directly? You know, Jane, you had a, a slide where you you quite literally inserted um, you know the, what you had done in the middle of that legislative process, right? You know, is that what we're trying to do, or are we trying to you know create large scale interventions where we get the citizenry to come together? Are both of those things together? Or are we are we doing separate things? So you know, I, I just want you know each of each of you to really put to you know put as succinctly as possible um, for our audience what is the outcome here that we are that you're trying to actually you know see implemented or measure. Um, so whoever would like to go first, Jane. Okay. Um. So for us, it's about uh, increasing democratic legitimacy. Okay. Um, so it is literally about revitalizing democracy. So if you look at the, um, the growing complexity of our, of our societies and uh, the growing levels of technocracy, there's um, an ever widening gap between the citizens and those who are making decisions on their behalf. So, you know, I think this was even particularly apparent throughout the, the COVID pandemic, where, you know, the, it was uh, medics, uh, epidemiologists, virologists who were making recommendations and that were having serious repercussions on people's lives. But even before that, we have um, huge levels of access from vested interests who are affecting policy who are deciding what it is that will happen that will affect people's lives. And the voices of people aren't heard in that lobbying system in Washington or in Brussels or in Santiago. 
And so it's about actually bringing in the voices of ordinary people into that system so as their needs and interests can be articulated by them um, and, put, and, and putting it in there. Now, of course, it's also about bringing people together and you know they feel good and things. But for me, that, that's what it is. It's about trying to reduce that gap between techno technocracy, political elites and what's happening mm. and trying to insert the voice of, uh, of your father or my mother um, or whoever else it is so their needs and interests uh, can be heard from them rather than other people always speaking on their behalf. And, it, and just you know, a quick follow, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter then whether the referendum or what, what comes of it is necessarily what people wanted. If that happens, that's, that's good, but you know, when you're talking about democratic legitimacy, quite literally scaling that down and bringing people directly into conversation with their representatives, with the lobbyists, that's the outcome, that's the point here. That's the point. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, so, and that the, their wishes are then taken into account in the policy making process. Because in most policy making processes, it's the interests of the lobby groups that are taken into right. account. So this is about putting the citizens in there. Okay. Uh, Irina? Okay. Yeah, because I love me and you, or oh, it doesn't matter. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I cannot see, I'm so far. Uh, okay. I, of course, I agree with Jean, but uh, uh, I want to add another thing that is uh, actually related to all political environments we mentioned today, and it's also uh, very relevant for liberal democracy and uh, uh, in our case of Serbia, is that um, we know from the beginnings of the research on democracy that we need uh, that we uh, need political uh, citizens that are politically com competent in order to participate in political life. But on the other hand, we are proposing institutions that doesn't allow them to have political competence. The public sphere now in many countries, of Western Europe also, not only in liberal democracies, is polarized. They don't have, there is no dialogue, there is no spaces, there are always less and less spaces for discussion. And people can't, how can we expect actually to have politically competent people if they are not allowed to discuss political issues. On the other hand, we have different, other different trends and, and uh, politics that are like uh, political centers of political power are so far away from the people. Uh, like if you think about European Union, where they, you have supranational level of decision making, then you have different international organizations that they're making decisions in the name of the citizens. A citizen, can't understand actually what is going on in political life and you don't give them the space to discuss political issue they can't have political competence to decide and then we blame and then on the other hand they, we don't give them the space and then we blame them blame them to be uh, uh, to have a lack of political competence in this way through citizen assemblies in different kind of political institutes innovative and deliberate participatory institutions we are bringing them back into the political process, because only through the political process they can have political competence to participate in political life. And they can, they actually can, if you give them the spaces, all this research shows that people actually can participate it meaningfully in political life. And this is my, for me, this is the most relevant argument for uh, introducing democratic innovations. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, Gazella, do you want to follow up? Well, let's let's go further. I think uh, Irena Boyd, Irena and Jane said a lot what I wanted to say. All right, Tammy. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I like your question, um, and um, I think it definitely cannot be only about including citizens. It cannot be only about bringing more citizens uh, in. It has to be more than that if uh, we're talking about democratic innovation. I mean, it must be about improving democracy. It must be about enhancing democracy. And this means it must be about addressing democratic problems. Um, it must be concretely about addressing those problems that Lead us to say that um, representation is in crisis and that democracy is in crisis, and it's not merely um, somehow complementing 
for replacing um, representative deficits more than that. It's like addressing real challenges, like also social inequality and political exclusion and lack of accountability of um, political institutions, lack of responsiveness and um, lack of enforcement of the rule of law and structural problems of democracy, um, which then arise like, or give rise to the, all the symptoms we know um, as those related to the crisis of democracy. So I would say um, the outcome we must expect um, and what we should look at and uh, try to estimate or measure or as you said, um, is precisely the ability of um, those new democratic institutions to effectively address um, concrete democratic problems by means of citizen participation. So how much citizen participation can be the actual means to address um, those ends? I mean, democracy, thinking democracy, or enhance the quality of democracy, depending on how you want to call it, if you're calling about um, the same thing. I mean, how do we achieve that by means of citizen participation? So it's not merely making more citizens to participate. So this must be one of the outcomes. Political inclusion is one of the outcomes because political exclusion is one of the problems democracy face today. But how we do that by means of citizen participation? I mean, how citizens are not simply here the end, but they are the means and the end, and they able also to address um, and achieve also the enhancement of the other dimensions or ends of democracy, like really addressing concrete um, problems in different ways. So I think it makes difference to see this, um, perhaps talking about the same thing, but it makes a difference to think um, in the sense that um, the takes system participation as uh, not only the the, the, the main outcome we want to achieve, but it's mainly the main means to different outcomes we want to achieve, which are all leading to a better democracy. All right. I actually, I want to return really quickly to something that was said here. I'm, I'm reminded of a conference that the Arendt Center did some years ago. It was my very first Arendt conference, the crisis of, um, the crisis of education. Was that it? Right. And there, so, and as I'm sitting down and I'm listening, you know, especially within public health, this sounds very much like a uh, tertiary prevention. You know, we're getting people when they're dying, disabled and injured, you know, instead of as a, as a method of primary prevention, where we're getting people, you know, we'd like to not be having these conversations. So, to, you know, we would love this, but, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, where do you find your work, you know, intersecting with institutions of education? And, you know, early on, you know, this seems like a crisis of civic education and that we're, we're getting to this problem maybe a little too late in the process. Right. So as we're thinking about, you know, randomly selecting or um, or sampling individuals from the population or whatever method we might use, you know, where do where do youth come in? You know, there are high school students here. I'm thinking about how I had to explain to a senior the difference between a governor and a senator. Right. You know, like what's the you know, where do we fit this particular idea of democracy into our educational um, ambitions and imperatives? Yes. Gazelle. Gazella. Yes, that's very interesting because I also uh, uh, share the belief that uh, a crisis of education is something which is bringing us also to the crisis of democracy, uh, especially speaking from the experience of our region. Uh, but what, what is the case here? We have a paradigm which is very strong and still living that representative democracy is something which is, you know, good model. And we have to bring evidence in to tell the people who, who could, who have a power to, uh, to, you know, include this into the civic education, that there are other models which have to be somehow learned. You know, our maybe ultimate goal would be to include some parts of learning how to uh, do discussion, you know, how to be critical. That is also the part of this into the education. I mean, you have it in good schools, but you have a lot of schools which are not on that level. So that is also part of it. So we have to change the paradigm. So uh, I agree partially with all of them, which said that, uh, uh, you know, it's also about bringing people in, but it's also about changing institutions because we are like, uh, and I can now refer to Popper, he, he, he wanted, for example, to change, to have small experiments which are changing thing by thing. And this is it, you know, we are testing the possibilities of introducing new uh, practices and maybe turning them to institution which will actually uh, 
make our democracy better. And what does it mean, make our democracy better? It means that all of our people could live better, no matter of you know race, of the nationality, of gender. So they could all live better. How to achieve that? Uh, we believe that it's by inclusion and uh, listening to them and answering to their concerns, to their, you know, uh, wishes in a way, and that you, you should find a way how to do this. Representative democracy, it's not, you know, where you have four-year cycle of elections uh, with big politics, big words, that is not uh, taking into consideration the small, uh, you know, things which worry people on everyday basis. And this is the way we believe maybe, I mean, uh, this is something which we are actually researching, is this a way? Maybe we believe this, maybe some of them are challenging that, but we want to have more evidence to see if this is the way, then those who are making decisions should listen to this. And if they really want to work in the benefits of all people and benefits of democracy, then they could try to uh, implement this and we'll see what happens. I mean, we have no ready made answers for that. All right. Thank you so much. And questions? You, we have one question right here. I wanted to ask, Carolyn Lukensmeyer is my name. I wanted to ask you, Jane, given how successful citizen assemblies have been in Ireland, what do you see as the major forces making it possible to institutionalize them and the major forces against institutionalizing them? Uh, but the major force against institutionalizing them is obviously ongoing reluctance um, within the, the machinery of, uh, of government where it's, you know, the policymakers are used to having, you know, just uh, tick box public consultations that don't get much publicity or they can do what they want with it and a kind of a still an ongoing levels of uh, distrust about uh, ordinary citizens and, and what they might do and you know so people talk about the expense of it and the difficulty of it and and, uh, and so on so it's kind of an inertia and a kind of a, um, a wedding to the to the status quo and I suppose the thing about the institutionalization of it is just the more of them that we have um, and the more you can look to it the more um, people realise the kind of the, the valuable role that they can play. And in fact, the, the OECD is, is doing a lot on this. You know, the, the OECD's Open Government Unit and Claudia, I'm sure Claudia is, is tuned in here somewhere, um, have been doing an awful lot with, with governments around the world trying to promote uh, citizen participation and deliberation in different ways. Um, you know, saying that it's it's part of um, good governance and so on. But even if you look at the at the moment, there's a there's a deliberative event, the conference on the on the future of Europe, which is ongoing, um, which uh, there's been a, a a lot of kind of infighting in Brussels over. And when you look at how that's happening, you can see how at the political level there's an, there's a, a lot of uh, blockers there. A lot of the countries who, who want to stop this, who see it as uh, as kind of an alternative to, to their power bases. So there's there's definitely a lot of difficulties um, around it, but I think it's sort of small and uh, incremental um, incremental steps. And it has to be, I think, much more bottom up demand. So there's only so far that you know, kind of top down demand from governments, or indeed even. So almost top-down demand from academics and from from groups like this, you know, it's a it's a matter of um, trying to institutionalise some sort of uh, bottom-up processes that are that are really going to make a difference. Which I think is where some of the education um, comes into it that Mark was uh, was talking about there. And in fact, you know, we've been looking a lot at the the kind of the part of the educational thing, but also with older people. Um, so, you know, because we know that when we look at disinformation, for example, that it's often older generations who are, who are mo most implicit in, in spreading it. So, um, having that kind of demand, having people talk about it, um, I suppose, is really uh, what we're hoping for. But there, there's definitely institutional resistance. Any, are there any other institutional resistances that 
I mean, we've heard of some significant institutional <laughs> resistance in, in, in one context here, but uh, um, Tammy, do you, do you find any institutional, um, you know, pushback or at least in any of the experiments that you've, that you've been seeing, particularly surrounding, um, you know, the five really successful citizen assemblies that have, that have been occurring, any, any sort of pushbacks that have been occurring at an institutional level or within the particular experiments, no matter how small, just like barriers to implementation or anything of the, of the sort? I could not really get the the question. Can you please repeat? Do you in in any of the you know experimentations that that you've observed or that you've been seeing within you know within Latin America, um, are there any you know is there any pushback to institutionalization that you've encountered that you've seen um, you know places where maybe politicians are like ah this is not it or you know it's citizens you know similarly in the in the Serbian context they having a feeling of sometimes of you know negative outcome where they're like ah oh, well, this is not going to lead anywhere because they're you know it's pr happening in a captive context you know are there any sort of um, you know any of those sort of things happening yeah well yeah definitely I mean in in Latin America we do have a lot of institutionalization um, of participatory experiments. Um, so in many countries, some of them are like mandatory. They should take place, they should be created and institutionalized um, at the local level especially. Yeah, so that's why there are um, some, not only the participatory budget, but several forms of deliberative councils, for example, which are institutionalized basically um, every city yeah, in countries like for example, Brazil and Guatemala and Colombia. I mean, there is a whole uh, diversity of um, institutions, um, like real institutions. Now, what I can um, tell you is that um, institutionalization has not necessarily uh, dropped much. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily also more impact, not necessarily governments, they listen to more or politicians are more responsive to um, the deliberations and outcomes of those deliberative spaces because they institutionalize. I mean, they then successfully include more citizens, definitely, in bringing more people in. So that's that's my point also previously. But um, how much also they successful in enhancing democracy um, in the sense of really having impact. Um, impact is a problem. I mean, how much um, actually measuring and assessing um, the outcomes, not only about um, politicians and government uh, listening to that, of course, we have um, means to do that um, sometimes, and this will many times come through institutionalization, but also not. So if we look, uh, for example, statistically, yeah, this data from, from the uh, Latin data set, we will see um, actually no much correlation between institutionalization and the formalization of democratic innovations and their impact in mean, their outcomes, concrete outcomes and uh, outputs, and also outcomes in terms of a um, public policy. There are a few cases, there are a few exceptions, like the, a, a big deliberative citizen assembly that took place in Brazil, the national public policy conferences that were actually uh, national level, linking local to national um, level with several stages of deliberation, but with no solution and no random selection at all. But apart from that, um, very similar to, to citizen assembly, um, except that they really huge. And then in that case, there was a lot of impact through institutionalization, but not always. So uh, you, you also see in the last years, a lot of impact from digital democratic innovations and from initiatives of civil society, which are not um, endorsed by the government at, at all, but somehow the government is listening to that. So um, I think yeah, there is no room. Of course, there are advantages with institutionalization, um, but not necessarily. Definitely in the sense of including more citizens, making sure that participation will take place, but not necessarily, I would say, in terms of outcomes and not improving democracy. All right. Uh, are the questions online? Thank you. Yeah, this is a question for Jane from uh, Susan Wright on the webcast. So Susan is troubled by the notion that non-experts know as much as experts, especially in science. Um, should we dismiss experts and allow non-experts to make decisions, these policy decisions, or how do we deal with this skepticism or distrust? 
Yeah, no, it's absolutely not that a non-scientist knows as much as scientists or, or would make the decisions. So, for example, um, we had the um, a citizen assembly on um, climate change mitigation. So, the citizens listened to the experts, but of course there's a range of measures you can take. You know, you can choose to focus more on methane emissions from, um, you know, uh, cows or you can, you can choose to focus more on, uh, on transport. You can be looking at, well, what sort of balance of renewables are you going to have? So the whole idea, and actually we've been doing some experiments on it, uh, on it recently in the, in the US as well, and it's really interesting. We've got some findings that if you say to people, you know, citizen assembly has said this, um, you will correct some misperceptions and they'll become a little bit more likely to agree with the proposal. But if you can say to them that the citizen assembly listened to experts and there was expert consensus, then you actually uh, move people's opinions. So in fact, in, in that instance, we actually uh, found that you could move the um, opinion of um, Republican leaning uh, voters who are, we did this on kind of COVID misperceptions. So it's that kind of combination of citizens of people like me listening to the experts and particularly when it's expert consensus rather than uh, an individual expert. So the whole idea is that uh, these citizens assemblies can, as I was saying, kind of reduce the gap between the experts and the citizens that, uh, that is growing as our societies get more complex. So it's a way of bringing expert evidence in and allowing people to look at it and look at the implications of it and think about it and decide on, you know, relative priorities that are based on that expert evidence. Thank you. One more question from online. No more? Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, or do you have your hand up? Yeah, right there. Hi, um, I'm Sophia Arnold, um, and I just have a question um, on like the idea of sortition with citizens. Do you think any of the blame is on the citizen and any of the pushback against sortition is based on citizens and how they feel about the system being effective or a safe system? All right. Does anybody want to take that one? Can you repeat the question? If nobody else wants to, I can quickly. A lot of people are very reluctant in the beginning. They go, well, who are these ordinary, who are these random citizens? You know, it's one of the, the pushbacks that you see most often. You know, we had it in Ireland, but you saw it in Scotland and even in, in Paris and so on. So I think part of the value of some of the experiments is demonstrating um, not just to, uh, to elites, but also to other citizens that in fact that people like them can be trusted, especially when it is that they're actually looking at things and they're looking at expert evidence and they're spending the time. So there's different mechanisms, but one of the things is a kind of heuristic or a shortcut about what would somebody like me think if they were able to take the time and space to really think about this? Because most people, their lives are too busy to be able to take the time and space about every small issue that impacts them. So it can be a useful heuristic for them. But of course, this is something they're not used to thinking. So, you know, some people will be reluctant in the beginning. And there are, you know, skeptics, you know, there's kind of, you know, 28%, 30% of people who are always more distrustful, you know, so you have to look at some of the cognitive literature there as well. All right. Well, thank you. And I want to give a round of applause to our panelists, especially zooming in from wherever you are at.